There are a great many footballers who look set for stardom and are adored by a certain fan base, only for them to crash and burn in terms of either their own careers or their reputation amongst that set of supporters. We see this happen all the time, and it is something that is unavoidable, especially given the way in which the media often like to build young players up by setting totally unrealistic expectations of them, only to knock them back down again. Twinned with the manic depressive nature of football where emotions always seem to be charged to the extremes. Within this world of false prophets, failed wonder kids and short-lived saviors though, there are some players who experience the opposite career trajectory, going from zeros to heroes rather than the other way around. To be clear, I don't just mean players who had slow starts or who came from modest beginnings, like Ian Wright or Jamie Vardy for example, and went on to achieve greatness. That wouldn't really be redemption, would it? You can't regain something that you never had. And, well, it wouldn't be an arc either, would it? This is an arc. As you can see, it goes down and then back up again. This would be Ian Wright or Jamie Vardy's careers plotted on a similar graph. And that, well, that isn't an arc at all, is it? It's just a line. Well, I am awfully glad that we were able to clear that up, and to think, some people say that my introductions are too long. Bloody Philistines. Here are seven even more remarkable redemption arcs than Ebenezer Scrooge in A Christmas Carol, and unlike Scrooge's redemption arc, they weren't just written in a Dickens novel, they actually happened. Within the weird and wonderful world of football. Seventh, Tiago Silva. It is easy to fall into the trap of thinking that everything has always been very plain sailing for Thiago Silva, because that is the way that he plays the game. Still at the top of his game now at Chelsea, age 37, it's difficult to remember a time when Silva wasn't one of the best centre-backs in the world, but that time did exist. In fact, there was a time when Silva wasn't even a centre-back at all. Born in Rio de Janeiro, Silva began his U-team career with Fluminense, in defensive midfield. With opportunities limited for him at Fluminense, Silva had unsuccessful trials at Madureira, Olaria, Flamengo, and Botafogo, before he ended up signing for a small lower league team called Barcelona. That isn't a silly dig at FC Barcelona, they are a different club based in Brazil. Silva eventually made a name for himself at RS Futebol in Rio's regional third and second divisions, before he attracted the interest of top flight Juventud. Just a single season in the Campeonato Brasileiro was enough to catch the eye of European teams, and Silva, who had previously turned down a move to AS Roma, joined reigning European champions Porto for 2.5 million euros in January 2005. Despite arriving with a big reputation, Silva didn't make a single first team appearance for Porto, spending half a season playing for the club's reserve team in Portugal's third tier before he was sold to Russian Premier League side Dinamo Moscow after just six months at the club. Silva not only also never played for Dinamo's first team, he was diagnosed with tuberculosis in the Russian capital and told by doctors that there was a chance he could die. Although Silva thankfully recovered, he decided during his rehabilitation that he would retire from football, age 22, and not having played a game of first team football in two years. You can see where I'm going with this one. Thankfully, Silva's mother convinced him to change his mind, and in 2006, his former coach brought him back to Fluminense, this time as a first-team player. And in three seasons, he played 143 times and became a full Brazilian international. Silva's full redemption arc was truly completed in January 2009, when he returned to Europe, where he immediately became one of the best, and indeed, one of the most complete central defenders in the European game at AC Milan. Moves to PSG and Chelsea obviously followed, and Silva's reputation as one of the most decorated and talented defenders of his generation is now firmly set in stone. Not bad for a man who couldn't get a game at Porto or Dinamo Moscow, almost died of tuberculosis, and retired at 22. Sixth, Luka Modric. Luka Modric is another player who has been so good for so long that it may be hard for some viewers to envisage him ever having not been universally loved and appreciated. But, in actual fact, Modric has had 
not one but two redemption arcs over the course of his glittering career, one in Croatia and one in Madrid. We will start with the less dramatic one at Real Madrid, who signed Luka Modric from Tottenham Hotspur in the summer of 2012, following one of the most protracted transfer sagas of the modern era. Modric had been brilliant for Spurs, hence Madrid's persistence in trying to sign him, but in his first season at the Bernabeu, he found it really difficult to make his mark on proceedings. At the end of his debut campaign, in a poll conducted by Marca, the Spanish magazine's readers voted Modric to have been the worst signing of the season. Over the summer, however, Mesut Ozil and Michael Asien departed, and Modric found his feet. A year later, Xabi Alonso and Angel Di Maria also bid the club farewell, and Modric quickly established himself as one of the best midfield all-rounders of the modern era, in a deeper role to the position he had played in at Spurs. He has since played 436 games for Real Madrid, where he has won 20 trophies, and is the only player not named either Messi or Ronaldo to win the Ballon d'Or in the last 15 years. Quite the redemption arc, wouldn't you say? And you might have thought, therefore, that Modric would have been deified in Croatia. And he was, at one time. However, in 2018, when longtime Dinamo Zagreb chief and the most powerful man in Croatian football, Zdravko Mamic Stotral, for embezzlement and tax evasion, Modric was called by the court as a witness. Despite having previously told investigators, on the record, that Mamic had added a clause which annexed most of Modric's transfer fee to Mamic only after his transfer to Tottenham, in court, Modric revised his statement and said that the clause had been added whilst he was still at Dinamo. Modric was charged with perjury for altering his statement, and it lost him the support and affection of much of the Croatian public, who despised Mamic more so than, well, almost anyone else, and felt that Modric was covering his tracks, making it harder to convict him, and therefore harder to clean up corruption in Croatian football. Consequently, Croatia went into the 2018 World Cup with a bit of a sourness surrounding both the national team and their star man. But it would be hard to maintain that ill will as the country reached the World Cup final for the first time with Modric stealing the show. Though Croatia fell at the final hurdle to France, it was a remarkable run. And it proved pivotal in Modric becoming the first Croatian to win the Ballon d'Or. In October and then for a second time in December 2018, the perjury charges against Modric were rejected by Croatian courts. Meanwhile, Mamic was sentenced to six and a half years in prison, but he hasn't spent a single day behind bars because he fled to Bosnia, who refused to extradite him on account of him being a Bosnian citizen. If you want to find out more about the crimes of Zdravko Mamic, how he escaped justice for so long and continues to do so, and the corruption that plagues Croatian football, they are all covered in much greater length in my documentary entitled What on Earth is Going On at Dinamo Zagreb? Yes, that is a plug. Fifth, David Beckham. One of the most famous footballers, and indeed athletes of all time, there is polling that suggests that almost a decade since retiring, and despite never having been in the same bracket as them in terms of his talent, David Beckham, is still the most recognisable footballer in the world, ahead of Cristiano Ronaldo and Lionel Messi. Whilst Beckham was never in the same bracket as Messi or Ronaldo, he was an exceptional footballer, and one of the best long-range passers, crossers, and free-kick specialists of all time. Having been a boy wonder at Manchester United for the past three years, as Beckham's celebrity first began to grow, he was one of England's star men going into the 1998 World Cup. Having started in every one of England's qualifiers for the tournament, Beckham was dropped for England's first two games of the World Cup, as manager Glenn Hoddle accused him of lacking concentration. Following defeat to Romania in England's second group game, however, Beckham was recalled for the final group game against Colombia, in which he scored a 30-yard free kick. That redemption would be very fleeting, though. In the round of 16, Beckham infamously flicked out a leg at Diego Simeone after the Argentine had come straight through the back of him. There was absolutely nothing in it, but it was incredibly stupid, and the referee sent Beckham off. The game ended in a draw, and England lost 4-3 on penalties. The response from the English press was, well, 
just as vicious and mean-spirited as you would expect from the most toxic media ecosystem anywhere in the world, and it created a really visceral hatred of Beckham throughout much of England. It sounds mad now, but an effigy of Beckham was famously hanged outside of a London pub, and the Daily Mirror published a darts board with Beckham centred on the bullseye. Fast forward three years, and Beckham, who had by this point become a controversial appointment as England captain, scored a stunning injury time free kick against Greece, which saw England qualify for the 2002 World Cup ahead of Germany. To put the icing on the cake, Beckham scored the only goal of the game as England beat Argentina 1-0 in the group stage of the 2002 World Cup, which ultimately saw Argentina eliminated. That was Beckham's remarkable redemption arc, at least as far as most people are concerned. I would argue that he is far more of a villain for taking £150 million to legitimise and promote a World Cup built by indentured servants at best and modern day slaves at worst, despite already having a net worth which is equivalent to the GDP of a small country, than he is for getting a stupid red card as a 23 year old. But hey, that's just me. Fourth, David Martindale. In Thiago Silva, Luka Modric and David Beckham, this seven has so far focused on so-called A-listers from the world of football. So I thought that I would break that up in fourth. I suspect that a number of you said to yourselves, David who? Just a moment ago, but though he may not have the pedigree of a Beckham or a Modric, David Martindale's redemption is even more extraordinary. Born into poverty in Glasgow, Martindale spent time in the Motherwell and Rangers academies but he was released by both clubs, having failed to take football seriously at that age. Martindale continued to play amateur football in Scotland's non-league game, entering the pub and restaurant business as his source of income. However, after his business began hemorrhaging cash, Martindale became involved in organised crime, specifically, or primarily at least, money laundering and dealing cocaine. Two years after he was caught in 2004, Martindale pled guilty and was sentenced to six and a half years behind bars. Martindale graduated with a degree in construction project management whilst he was in prison, but whilst working in the industry following his release, he also started volunteering at Livingston. Even at this point, Martindale's appointment as a volunteer was scrutinised by the local press, given his previous conviction, and that scrutiny intensified when he was appointed as assistant manager just two years later. In November 2020, Martindale took interim charge of Livingston, and four wins from four games convinced the club to offer him the role on a permanent basis. Although Martindale accepted, the Scottish FA scheduled a hearing on whether he was a fit and proper person to occupy that position. They found in Martindale's favour, and that season, Livingston recorded their highest league finish since 2002, and the following year, Martindale guided the club to the Scottish League Cup final. Bex might have seen red, but he never saw a sick stretch behind bars. In all seriousness, Martindale's redemption going from promising academy player turned convict and then widely respected manager is an uplifting one, at least for anyone who believes in the idea of rehabilitation. Third, Dmitry Olenichev. A man who came of age during the collapse of the Soviet Union, Dmitry Olenichev represented both Russia and the USSR at under-21 level, before making his senior international debut in 1996. Age 23, Olenichev was playing for Spartak Moscow at the time, and in 1997, he was named as the Russian Player of the Year. That prompted a move to Roma, worth £5 million, a big fee at the time, but Olenichev spent just 18 months at the club, playing 42 times, where he was labelled as one of Italian football's worst imports before being shipped out on loan to Perugia. A transfer to Porto followed where, despite making a bright start, Elenichev was frozen out after Octavio Machado was appointed as the new Porto boss. His days with the Portuguese giants appeared to be numbered, but after Machado was sacked and Jose Mourinho was appointed in his place, Elenichev was thrown a lifeline. Mourinho liked him. And though Olenichev was a number 10, rather than a centre-forward, he became Porto's go-to super-sub, being introduced in almost every game. Olenichev actually started the 2003 UEFA Cup Final for Porto, repaying Mourinho's faith in him by scoring the winning goal against Celtic. 
And just a year later, he came off the bench to score in a major European final once again, this time against Monaco, as Porto won the UEFA Champions League. It was Russian redemption on a truly epic scale, and over a remarkably short period of time. But Elenichev's story wasn't quite done yet. In 2004, he returned to Spartak Moscow to great fanfare, but ended up getting sacked in 2006 after he publicly criticised manager Alexander Starkovs. Age 34, after his contract was terminated by Spartak, Elenichev decided to retire, entering politics and joining the United Russia Party, which is the nation's largest political party, and is supportive of President Vladimir Putin. Elenichev left politics after three years to take charge of Russia's under-18 team, but he has been out of work since 2019. Second, Ronaldo. When Ronaldo first burst onto the scene at Cruzeiro, scoring 20 goals in 21 games during his debut campaign, as just a 16-17 to year old, it was immediately clear that he was a special player who was destined for greatness. Ronaldo proved that that was the case, scoring 54 goals in 57 games for PSV following a move to Europe, followed by 47 goals in 49 games during his only season at FC Barcelona. By the age of 20, Ronaldo had twice broken the world record transfer fee, the first player to do so since Diego Maradona, and at 21, he scored his 200th career goal and won his first Ballon d'Or. It seemed as though there really was nothing that could stop Ronaldo, and going into the 1998 World Cup, Brazil were the favourites, and Ronaldo was the best player in the world. He lived up to the hype, tearing every one of Brazil's opponents to shreds en route to the final, where Brazil would face the host nation France. But just hours before the final, Ronaldo suffered from a convulsive fit and was removed from Brazil's starting lineup and replaced by Edmundo. However, after Ronaldo pleaded with manager Mario Zagallo that he was fine, despite the fit, the Brazil boss reinstated him to Brazil's starting 11. Ronaldo was barely involved in the final as he stumbled around the pitch like a punch-drunk boxer and France won the game 3-0. In the inquest that followed, both Brazil's team doctor and Zagallo, who left Ronaldo on for the full 90 minutes, said that they feared the public outcry and backlash if they had denied Ronaldo from playing. The following season, Ronaldo began suffering recurring knee injuries, which culminated in a complete rupture to his kneecap tendons. Physios and surgeons described it as the worst injury that they had ever seen, and there were serious doubts about whether Ronaldo would ever be able to play again. By the time the 2002 World Cup rolled around, Ronaldo had played just 16 games in the previous more than two years. But following a shambolic qualification campaign, Luis Felipe Scolari included him in his squad regardless. Though Ronaldo had lost some of his blistering pace, he certainly hadn't lost his ability to score goals. In seven games, Ronaldo scored eight goals, winning the tournament's golden boot and most crucially of all, scoring twice in the final against the previously indomitable Oliver Kahn to lay rest to his heartbreak of 98, and to complete one of football's greatest ever redemption arcs. First, Bert Troutman. Bert Troutman, real name Bernhardt, but apparently the English found that too difficult to pronounce, has one of the most extraordinary life stories of any footballer to have ever played the game. Born in Bremen, Troutman joined the Hitler Youth as a child, the Luftwaffe as a teenager. He was captured as a POW by the Allies twice. He escaped both times. Then he was caught a third time by the Americans. He was detained in a British POW camp. He didn't escape that time. Decided to stay in England after the war. Ended up playing for Manchester City, where he famously played on, despite breaking his neck, in an FA Cup final. Yeah, there is quite a lot to unpack there, I'll admit. I can't cover it all, so we will just focus on the redemption aspect. Having been a distinguished soldier in the Luftwaffe, Troutman served as a paratrooper and won five medals for his bravery, including a first-class Iron Cross. Troutman lived a charmed life, fighting for three years on the bloody Eastern Front before being transferred to the Western Front, where he was captured. Because Troutman had been indoctrinated by Hitler Youth and Nazi ideology from the age of only nine, and joined the Luftwaffe voluntarily at the age of 18, rather than being conscripted, he was considered to be a Category C POW by the British, which 
meant that they considered him to have probable Nazi leanings. There were four categories in total, A, B, C, and D, designated for those who were considered to be anti-Nazis, non-ideological, probable Nazis, and ardent Nazis. Troutman was later downgraded, or upgraded, I think, we can safely say is probably the more appropriate terminology given the context here, to a category B POW, and whilst playing football in the POW camp, he discovered he had a talent as a goalkeeper. After the war ended, Troutman turned down the offer of repatriation in 1948 and chose to stay in Lancashire instead, joining non-league St. Helens Town as a goalkeeper. His performances were such that, after a little over a year, a queue of league clubs wanted to sign him. But keen to remain local, Troutman joined Manchester City. The Citizens' decision to sign Troutman was extremely controversial. More than 20,000 fans gathered outside of Main Road to protest against his arrival, supporters threatened to return their season tickets, and letters from across the country poured in by their thousands. In his first season, Troutman had to contend with supporters shouting Kraut and Nazi at him throughout most games. Troutman had actually deserted during the war before he was captured by the Americans, as one of only 90 members of his initially 6,000 soldier strong unit that survived the war. During his time in the POW camp, Troutman was further denazified, gradually ridding himself of the genocidal ideology that had been drilled into him since he was a child. Ultimately, Troutman's outstanding performances and his clear disdain for Nazi ideology eventually won everyone over, and his performance in the 1956 FA Cup final when he finished the game despite breaking his neck, literally, cemented his status as not just one of the greatest goalkeepers to have ever graced the English game, but surely one of the bravest as well. As I said, there is much more to Troutman's life than I've even touched upon here, and if it has piqued your interest, I would recommend the 2018 biographical film The Keeper, which is all about him, and is one of the better football films that I've personally watched. That is it for today's video. Thank you all very much as of watching. Those are just seven examples, of course. There are many other redemption arcs out there, and if you absolutely adore this video and just couldn't get enough of it, there is always the option of making a part two. I don't do it often, but the option's always there. As I say, thank you all very much as of watching. Hit the like button if you did enjoy today's video. I hope that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and make sure you're subscribed and have notifications turned on for HITC7s. You can also find me on social media, on either Twitter or Instagram, via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so. You might as well, there's no harm. You can always unfollow if you get bored of me.